Hey church, it's great to see you today online. Uh, my name is Riley. And I'm Chesley, and we're so glad that you're here today. We hope you're having a great day so far. Mm -hmm. If this is your first time tuning in to one of our services, thank you so much for joining us. We're glad you're here. And we would love to ask you right now to take a minute to fill out the form here on your screen and tell us just a little about yourself so that we can get in touch get connected with you and see how we can get you involved here at Calvary. Yeah, we definitely want to get to know you today. So fill out that form. We also want to see how you're worshiping today. So as the service is going on, please take some photos, shoot some videos. We want to see what's going on as you're taking in the service. Maybe you're home right now and your dog is all over you as you're trying to watch this service. Maybe you just poured your favorite cup of coffee and spilled it all over the ground. Maybe your toddler is dancing around, singing and worship. We want to see it. <laughs> Whatever it is, throw it up on your Instagram, your Facebook, your Twitter. Tag at Calvary Monterey. We want to see it and share it and kind of help this be a part of how we take in the service together and really join in community, knowing that we're all taking in the service at the same time together. So with that, please go to your inbox as well. If you're signed up for our Calvary Connection, then you probably just received an email from us about today's service and about how to continue living on your Christian faith throughout this next week. In that email, Pastor Nate's sermon notes are in there. There's some buttons, some links, all kinds of good stuff to help you think through how you're going to continue to give and serve and love the people around you. Well, we're ready to jump into this service mm -hmm. now. And we just want to encourage you now to invite the Lord into your space, mm -hmm. whether it's your bedroom, like we're in right mm -hmm. now, your kitchen, your dining room, wherever you may be, mm -hmm. let's focus our attention and our hearts on the Lord right now and join Pastor Brenton in worship. Hey, church family, welcome. A lot of times we'll begin our worship services by reading a scripture and, and usually I'll read it and you'll listen along. But today, I'd love for you to read this out loud with me, wherever you are in your home, whether you're by yourself or with your family or a roommate. The text will be on the screen there. Let's read from Psalm 34 together. Here we go. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed. Let's pray together. Lord God, today we look to you. We set our eyes upon you. We say, let us exalt his name together. Even if we aren't together physically, we can still, God, exalt your name together as a church family dispersed all throughout this community. So that's what we set this time aside to do right now, to look toward you today. And we ask that our face would become radiant from your glory and your presence with us. We ask it, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. Consider all the worlds thy hand hath made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. And then sings, then sings my soul. Oh, my Savior. 
God to thee how great how great thou art how great thou art then sings then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art and when I think that God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on that cross my burdens gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin and sings then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Oh, how great you are. When Christ, when Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and they proclaim my god how great you are then sings then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art oh how great you are and through every every heartbreak to every circumstance I believe that you are my fortress you are my portion you are my hiding place I believe that you are the way the truth the life The truth, the lie. Well, I believe through every blessing, through every promise, through every breath I take, I believe that you are provided, you are protected, you are the one I love. Yeah.
horizon And it's a new horizon And I'm set on you And you meet me here today With mercies that are new All my fears and doubts They can all come to Because they can't stay long When I'm here with you Oh, it's a new horizon And I'm set on you And you meet me here today With mercies that I knew Oh, all my fears and doubts They can all come to Because they can't stay long And I believe that you are The way The truth The light sing it together the lie oh, I believe that you are the way the truth the lie oh, I believe that you are um, Father we come before you right now and just thank you Lord for another Sunday Another day where your sun rose, Lord, and God, we know that it will set and that it will just be a beautiful day to worship and to praise you. God, help our perspective, help our minds, help our hearts right now to be set on, on you and your goodness and your grace and your mercy. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for worship. Thank you so much for just being a part of your church. How we just offer this time to you and thank you and praise you in your name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Uh, my name is Pastor Joshua. Uh, I'm the youth pastor here at Calvary. And I just want to say welcome wherever you're at, whatever you're, wherever you're sitting. Uh, maybe you're laying in bed watching this or you're sitting at a table eating pancakes. That's what me and my family did last Sunday was I woke up, I made pancakes and bacon, and we sat at our kitchen table and watched uh, Pastor Nate teach his message. And so wherever you're at, just welcome uh, to just another Sunday morning of, of worshiping Jesus together as the body of Christ. And you know, guys, no matter where you're at, no matter what you're doing, I just want to encourage you to continue to connect with us. Uh, the staff here at Calvary are, are honestly just working all over the place uh, in all kinds of, of areas of social media to connect with you. Um, we've got daily devotionals going out on Instagram and our Calvary webpage and on YouTube. Um, we've got sermons being put out. Our youth ministry has a podcast. I'm going to drop the name. What's the Wi-Fi password? Go check it out. Uh, we are, we've got all kinds of stuff going and you can find all those and connect with all those at calvary.com. So I just want to really encourage you to do that because during this time, I mean, that's really how uh, we get to continue to love on you as the church and as the pastors that just love and pray over you. So, you know, April's coming and with that in a couple weeks is Easter, which is a beautiful time where, where the body of Christ gets to to commune together and come together and just worship and praise our Jesus for what he did on that cross and then raising from the dead, not only conquering sin, but conquering death. And so, you know, church, because of these times, we can't gather together physically, but I want you to know, and we want you to know here at Calvary that we're going to continue to push forward and we're going to have a good Friday service and also an Easter Sunday service. Those things are going to be live streaming and so I really want to encourage you to just put, up, put aside that time to sit with your family and to live stream that Good Friday service and that Sunday Easter service. So please join us during that time. I know you're going to be blessed for it. And I know our Lord's going to be glorified, even as we're dispersed, as the body of Christ worships, worships him for the cross and his resurrection. Now, the last thing I want to talk to you about, and the last thing I just want to say from my heart to you is thank you so, so much for continuing to partner with us uh, financially through this uncertain time. I, I get it. This is a hard and this is an uncertain time where we really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or a week from now, but we can know and we can continue to have faith that our God is on the throne, 
that he is worshiping and that he is, uh, I'm sorry, we are worshiping him and that he is, is in control of all things. And I just want you to know that your church is just continuing to push forward through that. So thank you for supporting us financially so that we can continue to support our missionaries and our ministry here on the Monterey Peninsula. And so just to kind of continue with our morning uh, of worship and praise, let's pray over those tithes and offerings uh, so that, that we could just continue in worship and get into the word together, guys. So Father, we come before you, we praise you, we worship you that, that we can uh, just give to you and give back to you in so many ways. We can, we can praise you through song, we can praise you through the reading of your word and, and helping others, God. But we can also praise you uh, by, by giving, Lord, and, and giving financially. So God, we just offer these things up to you, offer these tithes and offerings up to you uh, as we, we just give this in your name, Lord. Amen. Even so, it is 
Thank you for being a God who meets us right where we are. Lord, that whether we're walking on a beach alone or seated in our living room or in our bedroom looking at our phone or in any other place, Lord, you are present. You are there with us. And Lord, we pray today that by the power of your Spirit, knowing that we cannot gather together in one location, we pray, Lord, that by your Spirit, you'd meet us as if we are gathered together in one location. Lord, it says in your word that you inhabit the praises of your people. So though we know that you are everywhere and at all times and in all places, you are especially present as your people gather to celebrate you. And we pray, Lord, that as we are gathered across space and even time as we watch this at various moments throughout the week, we ask, Lord, and pray that by your Spirit, you would be present with us as your people. Father, during this time, we want to continue to be faithful to pray for our governing authorities, Lord, that you would give them wisdom, and discernment to know how to lead us at this time. We pray, Father, for your provision, both for our hospital medical system, but also, Lord, for the millions of lives that are being impacted financially during this season, especially, Father, those who belong to you, who are part of your church. We pray, Lord, as well for health, for healing, Lord, that this sickness would be driven from our world. And Lord, that you especially here as we pray for the Monterey Peninsula, the Monterey County community, we ask, Lord, that you would drive it from this region. And we pray, Lord, in a special way for even our own church family and ask, Lord, that you would give us health, Lord, and that you would divinely watch over each one of us, Lord, every man and woman and child, that you would take care of us, Lord, during this season. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity, although not the way that we would normally like to, to still be able to have a semblance of a gathering together. We pray, Lord, that you'd meet us here in your holy word. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. Amen. Well, church, it's so great to be with you again on another Sunday. Obviously, like we keep praying and saying, it's not what we would want to have to be able to gather in this kind of way, but at least we're able to do this. And I just want to thank you for taking the time, setting apart part of your life to be able to uh, take in this church service, to engage with God's word, to worship the Lord, and to 
uh, continue to be part of your spiritual family here on the Monterey Peninsula uh, called Calvary Monterey. If you're new here to the church, if you've, you've never actually been to the church facility and taken in a service or been part of the church before, or if you are new in the sense that you've just been hurting and you are scared or nervous and you're looking for the truth, you're looking for a word from God, then personally my conviction is that you are in the right place. And we welcome you and are so thankful that you're here joining together uh, with us today. Uh, I, I wanted to just say before I get into the word this morning that your church is doing so well right now. Uh, this is a hard time for everyone. This is a hard time for the world that we're living in and a difficult time for the community that we live in here on the Monterey Peninsula and a hard time for the church as well. But I'm happy to report that it seems that there are strong evidences or signs of God's grace among us. You know, your pastors, I've just been so thrilled to watch them working uh, their rear ends off to be able to minister to God's people. You know, they're reaching out with any uh, technology that they can to be able to care for you and love on you and minister to you. I'm so proud of the rest of the staff that is working hard to distribute scripture and teaching and devotionals and to help prepare these services as we gather together, not to mention other outreach-oriented endeavors and just the regular ministries that we have to keep on doing here uh, in the church. And I'm also proud of our life group ministry. The vast majority of our life groups are meeting online, usually using the Zoom software to be able to meet together. And I'm just so thankful for that. And many of you have reported and said, you know, life group was so great to be able to see each other's faces. So to me, these are all evidences of a strong church, you know, good leadership, the people coming together. And I just praise God and rejoice uh, for that. Some of you have reached out and asked how I'm doing, and I just want to let you know I'm doing really well. I am having a difficult time keeping off the pounds uh, because my wife and my three daughters all love baking, and we're just holed up in our house, and it seems like every day there's some new delicious baked good that is there to tempt me. Uh, but other than that, uh, you know, God has just been so good, and I'm so thankful uh, for still having a chance to share his word with you, and so thankful uh, that this isn't going to last forever and that we'll be able to be together again someday. And I'm praying that it's in the near future. At least that's my hope uh, and prayer. So um, we're going to get into the word now. Uh, Matthew, or excuse me, Mark chapter 3, if you turn there in your Bibles, Mark chapter 3. And we're just going to look at one little episode from the life of Jesus. Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, and a message I've called Seeing God correctly. And we're going to put the words on the screen for you wherever you're at, but you could also pull out your Bible and your notepad. And I would just encourage you, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. If we're here in the church sanctuary and having this time together, uh, you know that I can see you. So you know that I'll see when you're checking a text message or getting on Facebook or whatever, but you're at home right now and I can't see you. Um, so I would just encourage you, take some of those steps, maybe get out a notepad and your Bible and set your phone to the side so that you can focus during this next period of time as we get into and honor God's word uh, together. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the whole episode to you today, uh, say a word of prayer, and then jump into the teaching. Mark chapter 3, starting out in verse 1. It says, again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they, the religious leaders, in response to Jesus, were silent. In verse 5, he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately, verse 6, held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. Let's pray for our time in the word. God, please, 
wherever we are, speak to us today by the power of your spirit. And though, Lord, I'm in a room without people in it, just a handful of folks that are working cameras and providing so wonderfully the technology, Lord, would you cover all of that and would you fill me, Lord, with your Holy Spirit as I share and teach your word. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. Amen. Okay, so one Sabbath, the story tells us, Jesus again entered into the synagogue there in Capernaum. He goes to the public meeting. Mark says that when he got there, there was a man with a withered hand, and the whole story is going to center around this man. Now Luke, when he wrote his gospel, records for us that it was the man's right hand Hand. And Luke, being a physician, would have noticed that kind of detail. And to have a withered hand uh, meant that his hand was stiff or deformed or paralyzed. Now, the religious leaders, they knew Jesus' character and they knew of Jesus' power at this point. They'd, Jesus had already healed people. He had already expressed his power. And it was obvious that he loved people. So they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal this man on the Sabbath. In other words, they knew that Jesus would see this man. They knew that Jesus would be drawn to this man's brokenness. But the Pharisees, they didn't care about this man at all. Instead, what they wanted to see was if Jesus would heal a man on the Sabbath. Now, now why was this the big concern of the Pharisees? Well, it's because their legalistic interpretation of the Bible's Sabbath laws, like we saw last week, had concluded that they could only keep someone from dying on the Sabbath. If life was endangered, or if an injury would worsen without treatment, then on the Sabbath you could intervene medically. Otherwise, all other medical help had to wait until the Sabbath was over with. So if Jesus heals this man on the Sabbath, uh, then they will be able to accuse him, it says in verse 2. That's legal language. They were looking for a legal accusation to build a legal case against Jesus. Now Jesus knew their thoughts, as we saw in the passage. So Jesus, in verse 3, called the man to come forward. Then he asked the religionists, the legalists, the Pharisees, a searching question. Notice it there in verse 4 again. He said, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? And they didn't answer Jesus, but instead they were silent, it says in verse 4. And this angered Jesus. It infuriated Jesus. This was righteous indignation from Christ. And he looked around at them in his anger and was grieved at their hardness of heart. After that, Jesus told the man to stretch out his hand. And the man did. He stretched out his hand, and his hand miraculously was restored. Okay, even though Jesus didn't touch the man, didn't say a prayer over the man, didn't put his hands upon the man, it was clear that Jesus had just healed on the Sabbath day. Okay, for the religious leaders, this whole episode was a tipping point in their feelings about Jesus. Already in the previous four episodes, right before this one, we've seen that they didn't like how Jesus forgave a paralytic, how Jesus ate with sinners, how Jesus did not fast twice each week, and how he broke their Sabbath rules as the disciples walked through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Now, this healing of this man is the last straw for the Pharisees. And they respond immediately, it says in verse 6, by plotting with the Herodians as to how to destroy Jesus. Right away, they join together with a group in support of Herod's regime. These are people the Pharisees would normally be enemies with, but they join together to try to destroy this threat called Jesus. Jesus. Now, Jesus' ministry at this point is still pretty new, but this means that he's going to spend the rest of his ministry life under the threat of death. Jesus endangered their power, the Pharisees' power, 
And so for them, he was a threat to be neutralized. They wanted him gone. Okay, so that's a recap of the story itself that we just read in Mark 3, verse 1 through 6. But here's the question. What can we learn from this episode? And I'm sure there are plenty of things that we could look at today, but I want to focus on three lessons by focusing on three main characters. First, we're going to look at Jesus and what we can learn about God by looking at Jesus. Secondly, we're going to look at the Pharisees and Jesus' response to the Pharisees and see what we can learn from God by looking at the Pharisees. And then lastly, we'll look at the man with the withered hand and think about what we can learn of God by looking at this particular man. So for the first character, let's think about Jesus. And I would say it like this for our first point. Jesus in this story shows us that God is compelled to do good. God is compelled to do good. All through the story, we see Jesus' heart and intention to do good. Even the Pharisees understood this. Even the Pharisees realized this. That's why they watched Jesus when he went into the synagogue to see when he would notice this man with the withered hand. They knew that that man's presence would drive Jesus to the point of wanting to heal this man. By the way, wouldn't it be awesome to become like Jesus in this realm of our lives? You know, he was just drawn to people's pain. When he saw it, he wanted to help them. He, he grieved over them. His heart was broken for them. And there in the synagogue, all eyes were on Jesus and on that man. And everyone there knew what Jesus wanted to do. Oh, that God would do this in our hearts, that we would want to help those who are hurting. But for Jesus, on this particular day, there was no gray area. He asked them a question in verse 4. He looked at the Pharisees. He knew they didn't want him to heal on the Sabbath. And so he asked, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? It was one or the other for Jesus. You know, you could do good or you could do harm. You could save life or you could kill life. I love the way Jesus asked this question because asking it this way was his way of not letting them wiggle out of this question into some cunningly worded religious argument. You know, he wouldn't let them skirt the issue and try to take a middle path or a third way. It was either or in Jesus' mind. What should we do on the Sabbath, Jesus asked. Should we do good things on the Sabbath or should we do evil things on the Sabbath? Should we save life on the Sabbath or should we destroy or kill life on the Sabbath? Like I said, for Jesus, there's no third way. There's no middle ground. As God in the flesh, he could do no evil, and he could bring no harm. He was compelled to do good. He was compelled to save life. It was his only recourse. The only thing that he could do there that day was good. His very nature as God in the flesh demanded that he act for the betterment or the benefit of this man. Okay, why was Jesus driven to do this good and to bring life to this man? Well, because the Bible teaches God is love, and love wills for the good of its object. In other words, the love of God means that God craves the ultimate good for everyone who is a target of his love. So when we say God is good, it's really an extension of the truth that God is love. And we know that God is love. John 3, verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So as God in the flesh, Jesus was driven by love to do good. Okay, but this idea of God's goodness, it brings, I think, up a, a modern question about human suffering and evil. You know, many will object to the idea of God's goodness and God's power by asserting that a good and powerful God must not exist because of all the horrendous evil and suffering in our world. If God has the power, in other words, to eradicate suffering 
and the love to want our good, how could suffering still exist? People with this thought think he either isn't very loving or he isn't very powerful, but he surely can't be both. In his book, The Doctrine of God, Norman Geisler uh, states the normal argument of those who doubt God exists in this way. Number one, they would say an all good God would defeat evil. You know, that's what he would do if he was really good. Number two, an all powerful God can defeat evil. Number three, but evil is not defeated. So the conclusion for this argument is, number four, there is no such God. Okay, but this argument misapplies the truth about God. Because God is all good, but also all powerful, there's another conclusion that we should come to. The conclusion is this, he will vanquish all evil in the future. It is only his good and powerful nature that gives us any hope at all for the future, for the future decimation of wickedness. In other words, this is how a believer might say it. Number one, an all-good God would defeat evil. Number two, an all-powerful God can defeat evil. Number three, but evil is not yet defeated. That word yet is important for the Christian. Therefore, number four, all evil will one day be defeated. Because God is who he is, because he's all powerful and all loving, we can look at our world, see the chaos, and know because of his nature, one day all of this evil will be vanquished. There's no other option. Because God is who he is, evil must come to an end. Because he's good, he's inclined to see all that is bad is deleted. And because he's all powerful, he has the ability to get the job done. And with anticipation for thousands of years now, Christians have waited for the return of Christ so that we could see this glorious event where evil is eliminated and no more. And the cross of Jesus Christ helps us to understand this incredible truth. You see, at the cross, Jesus defeated sin, the devil, and the evil world system. He unleashed the power of God onto the world. Forgiveness and redemption and restoration are made possible by his blood. You know, interestingly enough, in this story, Jesus knew that he was in the synagogue that day to do good and to save life. But Doing good and saving life for Jesus that day would lead to his own harm because the religious leaders would start to plot to kill him. In other words, for him to do good, not just for this man, but for all of humanity, meant that Jesus would have to suffer harm. For him to save life, he'd have to be killed. Okay, what does this mean for us today? I think it means that we can look at our broken and fractured world and know that all this evil and all this tragedy will one day be done away with by Christ's appearance. He's defeated evil and brokenness on the cross, and one day that victory will be visible and secure. But I think it also helps us to know that Jesus is doing good today. There's no third way. There's no middle path for Jesus. He can only do good. And whether I see it or not, whether, whether it's obvious to me or not, or whether I feel it or not, I know that he is working good. This is part of what it means for us, brothers and sisters, to walk by faith. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, for we live by faith not by sight. Or in the New Living Translation, for we live by believing and not by seeing. You see, right now, you've got to trust Jesus. You've got to trust that he is doing good right now. Though evil and brokenness have their moment and are even having their moment, Christ is working toward a glorious future 
where every evil is defeated and tears will be no more. Okay, so that's what I wanted us to see from Jesus. But what can we learn from the Pharisees, the religionists, the legalists of Jesus' day? Well, I'd say it like this. Number two, from the Pharisees we learn God is angered by dead religion. Number two, God is angered by dead religion. Okay, it's amazing how these religious leaders responded to Jesus' questions. They, they just wouldn't do it. He asked, is it lawful to, to, on the Sabbath, do good or do harm, to save life or to kill? And they responded with total silence. I mean, I mean the answer is so obvious. Uh, but they couldn't bring themselves to respond. They couldn't confess that it was lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Now, like I mentioned earlier, we saw this problem last week when we looked at the passage of Jesus and the disciples walking through the grain fields, picking up or picking or plucking the heads of grain to eat. The Pharisees accused the disciples of reaping a harvest on the Sabbath day. The system they'd built around the Sabbath day was restrictive and incompatible with God's intention that the Sabbath be a life-giving experience for his children. Now, what had happened to these religious leaders? You know, what corrupting influence had gotten a hold of their hearts? What had made them so stiff, so rigid, so stubborn, so immovable? I mean, the littlest child could answer Jesus' question. The Sabbath day is obviously not a day for doing harm and doing evil, so it's a day for doing good and bringing life. Everybody knows that. Anybody could answer Jesus' question. But these men could not even bring themselves to think that way. Why? What had happened to them? Slowly over time, their love for God was replaced with love for their religious acts. In other words, their traditions and their interpretations had become the irreplaceable objects of their affection. They weren't doing these things for God but for tedious religious practices that gave them a sense of self-approval and holiness. And as they loved their little legalistic methods, they became blind. Paul describes them in Ephesians 4, verse 18. He says, though they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. You see, though God had prescribed the Sabbath and the sacrificial system for Israel, these men had forgotten what it was all about. They were meant to have a society which honored God, you know, complete with Sabbaths and festivals each year, sacrifices and a thriving and robust priesthood. As, and all of that was to be a witness to the surrounding nations. Their love for God was meant to be contagious to the whole world. Abraham's seed was meant to be a blessing to all of mankind. But God had warned them that religiosity should not replace true godliness. In the Old Testament, over and over again, he warns them. I'll show you two examples. Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, God said to them, I want you to show love, not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. Or in Micah 6, verse 8, No, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. But for the religious leaders, they'd ignored God's warnings, and they'd fallen in love with religion and forgotten about God and their fellow man. Love had been displaced with religiosity and tradition. And this angered Jesus. That's, that's what I said. It angered Jesus. Jesus was mad at what he saw. Mark said in verse 5, and he looked around at them with anger. Why was Jesus angry? Well, because he was grieved at their hardness of heart in verse 5. Jesus' anger grew out of what he knew. He knew that they'd become so hard-hearted, so entrenched, so fossilized in their traditions that not even the radical appearing of the Holy Son of God could shake them from their dead religiosity. There's the Son of God right there with them, and they will not budge. So Jesus was angry. 
It was righteous anger. It was anger without sin, but he was angry. Now, in Jesus, what we're seeing is the heart of God. God hates dead religion. He hates forms and traditions that get in the way of loving God and loving people. You see, the truth of the matter is that Jesus was the holiest person in that room. The Pharisees were not holier than Jesus. Jesus was pure. Jesus had never sinned and never would sin. Every thought, every intention, every feeling that Jesus ever had was submitted to his Father in heaven. And in his holiness, Jesus cared for this man. When Matthew told this story, he said that Jesus said, which one of you has a sheep and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. You see, this man was Jesus' sheep. He was more valuable than a sheep. In all his holiness, Jesus knew that it was time for him to do something good for this man. And the fact the Pharisees could not approve of such a good and loving action, all because of some twisted interpretation of the Sabbath, it angered Jesus. Because God, as I said earlier, is angered by dead religion. You see, Jesus said that the most important commandment is that we love God, but a second is like it, closely tied to the first, that we love our neighbor as ourselves. And Jesus did this. He loved God. And that love flowed into love for this man with the withered hand. That is true holiness. And God is angered by dead religion that blocks us from the holy life of loving God and loving others. Now, I want to ask a question. Because I'm wondering if many believers have fallen into dead religion. I, I wonder if many have not sought God personally, but have succumbed to lifeless tradition. And I wonder if God is going to use this current season that we're in of sheltering in place and social distancing to revitalize many of his people. And I wonder if God is waking some of his people up to what real holiness looks like, loving God and loving others. You know, this last week on our church social media accounts, I shared a little mini teaching on the doctrine of, of the priesthood of all believers, which was re-highlighted or reignited at the time of the Reformation. You know, Peter says in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, that the church is a royal priesthood. Revelation chapter 1 and chapter 5 say that we are a kingdom of priests. In other words, when Jesus saves you by his blood, you gain his position. He's the great high priest, and he brings you to God. You get access to the king, to the throne of God. So now believers have access to God and are his representatives here on earth. Okay, on the one hand, the priesthood of all believers is a delicate doctrine to address in our era. And part of the reason I say that is because some have used it to invent unbiblical doctrines that are totally unorthodox, kind of an I can do what I want because God told me so kind of attitude. That's not what the priesthood of the believers is meant to produce. Others have used the doctrine of the priesthood of the believers, of all believers, to remove themselves or distance themselves from church life and church leadership. Kind of a, the church is the people, so we don't need the institution of the church kind of attitude. And in individualistic societies like the one we're living in, the priesthood of all believers is often dealt with gingerly by pastors and teachers because we understand who we're talking to. We understand our, our audience. Western believers often look for any excuse they can to express themselves and already regard all institutions with suspicion. In other words, many modern believers in the West don't need a lot of convincing that they have access to God. They need convincing that they could only have access to God by the blood of Christ. But on the other hand, the reason I bring it up today is because many, while believing in the doctrine of the priesthood of the believers, have given up on it for all practical purposes. In other words, they believe they can go directly to God, 
They believe they are his representatives on earth, but in practice, they live as if God is only accessible at their church gatherings. And their church leaders are the only ones called to represent God here on earth. When we fall into this line of thinking or practice, when we fall into this rut, we try to live off a couple sermons a month, off a couple life groups a month, and believe that only our pastors are called to live holy lives. So maybe one thing that God could do with us during this season is to refresh us in the reality that every person covered by the blood of Jesus can enjoy God personally and be his representative here on earth. So let's confess something more like this. Let's say we love our churches. We follow our church leaders. We pray for the expansion of the church here on earth, and we will not forsake the assembly. We will faithfully attend and serve and participate in and give to our church, but we will not let tradition or religion or rote practices get in the way of our walk with God and our obedience to him. We will let this time of separation from the gathering stretch us and train us in our priesthood before God. We will personally and privately worship God and we will proclaim to the world the excellencies of God's glory. All right, let's conclude by turning our attention to the last of the three characters, the man with the withered hand. What can we learn from this man today? Well, I wanted to say it like this. Number three, the man, he teaches us that God offers restoration. God offers restoration. Okay, we should easily, I think, connect with the man with the withered hand on, on an emotional level. Um, I, I mentioned this in an earlier study in the Gospel of Mark, but that culture, the one that Jesus was in, that this man was in, they, they looked down upon forms of disability. Many people probably wondered if this man's withered hand was God's judgment on him for some sin that he had committed or that his parents committed, even if nobody knew what those sins were. This was a flawed perspective. But that flawed perspective, along with the normal human desire to avoid being gawked over or gawked at, would have kept this man as private as possible. I, I see this man going into the synagogue wanting not to be noticed at all. And I think he would have felt a measure of shame and embarrassment over his withered hand. To him, that hand was a weakness in his life. But Jesus, of course, came along and healed this man of his weakness on that Sabbath day. The word used by Mark is the word restored. Not healed, but restored in verse 5. Jesus restored the man's withered hand. In other words, he brought it back to health, back to what it was supposed to be in the first place. He restored the hand. And I think many of us, we sense our own personal weakness and brokenness within. Many of us, we're, we're embarrassed, if we're honest, by our bad habits, our unreasonable emotions. We're too fragile, too tender. We're, we're embarrassed by our, our broken relationships that litter our past or our personal failures. And we sense already that we're not everything that we're supposed to be or could have been, but at this point, what can we do about it? You know, we've tried to self-improve. We've tried to do better, but it's like it just never works. Like this man, we wish we could be different but to no avail. There's nothing we can do. But Jesus comes along, offering to help the man and offering to help you. He wants to restore you. He wants to grow you. He wants to help us. But how? How will he do this? Well, let's look at the man for an example. First, notice Jesus called the man forward. He said, come here. Some people translate that phrase, come here, as stand up, or stand up in the middle. In other words, Jesus made this man go public. He was no longer anonymous, but he was seen by the whole assembly. 
Now, I don't think for a moment that this felt good to the man. I, I think he wanted more than anything to go through the synagogue gatherings in private, escaping the notice of the onlookers. When they would raise their hands to the Lord, as was their custom in prayer, I think he wanted nobody to notice his withered hand. But now Jesus called him to stand out, stand up in front of the whole gathering. Front and center, there he is. But you see, this is important. You see, God wants you, he wants me to squarely face our need. He wants you to come to terms with your place of weakness. He wants the blighting and impotent areas and parts of your life to come front and center. He calls you forward. It, it might be through confession. It might come through admitting your weakness and fears to someone else. It might come by setting down the facade that you've got it all together. But Jesus is interested in that area of weakness in your life. He wants to deal with the disabled parts of you. So he calls you to step forward to him in your place of need. But second, the man had to believe in Jesus. I mean, he would have never interacted with Jesus if he hadn't believed that Jesus could do something about his condition. And you have to know the same. You have to know that Jesus can do something for you. You must believe he's a source of power and transformation that you need for life. You must become convinced that he has the ability to help you in your place of need, your place of weakness. As long as you think that the wisdom of the world is stronger than the power of Christ, you will not turn to him to help you in your place of weakness. But finally, what the man did last was obey Jesus. Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. Now, this was impossible for the man to do. And one thing I love about this man is that he refused to argue with Jesus at this point. You know, he could have like stopped and explained, uh, Jesus, I don't know if you've noticed, but I have a withered hand. I can't stretch out my hand. It's not something I'm able to do. I've tried to do it a million times before, and it's never worked. But instead of arguing with Jesus, the man obeyed Jesus. And as he did, as he stretched out his hand, it was restored. The power of Jesus met him as he tried, as he stretched out his hand. You see, the command of Christ includes the power of Christ. When Jesus tells you to do something, he is ready and willing to help you get it done. This man knew that he couldn't obey Jesus in his own strength. He knew that Jesus would have to help him. And with trust, he determined to obey Jesus's word. And as he did, the power of Christ came upon him. Paul said it this way in Philippians chapter 2. He said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In other words, step out, obey, try, and the power of God will work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You see, the truth is, brothers and sisters, we only have two options. We can argue with Jesus or we can obey Jesus. We can rationalize with Jesus or we can submit to Jesus. We can tell the Lord how long we've struggled with so, such and such or with so and so and how hard we've tried. Or we can end all of our arguing and set out in his power to obey. At that moment, when our hearts become soft, when we're ready to obey, we'll discover his new power, his new life, and new abilities that come from him. Everything we need, he will provide. As Peter said, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Jesus provides all things that are needed for life and godliness, 2 Peter 1, verse 3. So let's step forward to Jesus, believe Jesus, and obey Jesus. Only he can restore our places of brokenness.
Well, let me conclude by giving a handful of applications to you, as is our custom. Number one, I think a good response to this passage would be to set your hope for the future entirely upon Christ. You know, as I was mentioning earlier, God is good, God is powerful, so that means all evil must be vanquished at least some day. Set your hope upon that, the return of Christ. I don't know when he's coming, and I know that nobody knows when he's coming, but I know that he is coming, and at that moment he will make all things new. Number two, believe that he will work all things together for good. Believe that he will work all things together for good. You know, if if he is there only doing good, if that's Jesus's only recourse, then believe that he's taking the hardships of life, Romans 8, 28, and that he's working those all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Number three, thinking about the Pharisees, identify any traditions that have gotten in the way of your relationship with God. And like I mentioned earlier, it could even be a good tradition that you've allowed to become a rut in your life. You know, for me, I've been going to church every Sunday for like my whole life. And I have to discipline my mind and my heart to say, this is a day that the Lord has made. This is a moment for me to worship the Lord. This is a moment for me to receive from God. This is a moment for me to bless and minister to others. And this is a moment that is only emblematic of my entire week. We've got to have that attitude lest we fall into a rut in even things that are good for us to do in our obedience and allegiance to the Lord. Number four, if needed, let holiness be redefined in your life. I would venture to say that some people in thinking about the Pharisees thought, man, they really were holy. They weren't holy. That was faux holiness, fake holiness. Jesus, glad, rejoicing, feasting, celebrating, eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners, but pure and loving, loving God, praying, crying out to him, he was holy. Number five, Jesus remade you and put you into his priesthood, so Act like it is my application. And part of what I mean by that is during this time, during this season, you know, though we're not able to go out and about like we normally would, we can through our presence, whether it's online or with family members or friends that we're communicating with through technological means, we can communicate that we believe that God is on the throne. We can be ambassadors for God during this time and praise his name even in the midst of darkness. And number six, and lastly, determine what your withered hand is and bring it to Jesus. That's my assignment for you this week, church. Not that you would think of a million withered hands in your lives. I know I can think of so many, but think of one thing. Identify one thing this week that you would say, you know, that's an area of my life that I'm going to trust that as I step out and obey, the power of Jesus will meet me there and he will transform my place of brokenness. I love you so much, church, and I miss you so much, and I can't wait to see you again. As John said in 2 John verse 12, though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink, and I would rather not use streaming video and audio. Instead, he said, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. And I can't wait when we can be together face to face again. Okay, I'm going to pray now, and after I'm done praying, I'm going to hand it off to my friend, Pastor Riley, and my other friend, Chesley Monzo. The two of them are going to share a few little um, encouragements with you to send us on our way this week. Lord, thank you so much for your grace. And Lord, right now I pray that by your Spirit, those withered parts of us would be repaired by you. Thank you, Lord. And if you're here and you're watching today and you don't know Jesus and in your heart you want to believe in him, know that he died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the grave so that you might have everlasting life. Pray to God right now and say, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Thank you for sending Jesus to come into my life. Thank you that he died on the cross and rose from the grave 
Forgive me of all I've ever done and ever will do and make me new in you. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your church. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. God bless you, church. Hey, it's always so good to take in God's word, to worship together. And we recognize that this has been a different experience, you know, doing this all online. But thank you for tuning in. We've been praying that this would be a blessing to you, an encouragement, and that as God is speaking to you, that you'd have some things that you can really act on this week. Definitely. And if you're tuning in for the first time today, thank you again for joining us. And we want to encourage you to please fill out the form that you're seeing on your screen. And there's a way on that form for you to tell us what you might want to learn more about, whether if it's our kids ministry, our life groups, or more just about your faith. We would love to help you with that. So please tell us about yourself, and I will personally be in touch with you. She's so good about those emails. I mean, she will get back to you so fast. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. But hey, we also want to see you on Tuesday night right here mm -hmm. at 6.15 p.m. We're going to be continuing... Uh, going through the book of Genesis at our Tuesday night church service. So please come back on Tuesday and we pray that you're really encouraged as we continue to go through the Old Testament together. Right. And we wanted to also let you know that our life group ministry is still mm -hmm. happening. So this is our small group ministry that we normally meet in homes throughout the week. But right now, over 30 of our groups have been able to make this shift to meet online which is awesome. Yeah. And a lot of them still have room in them. So if you'd like to get connected with other people virtually for this time, uh, please fill out this, this form on your screen and let us know and we'll help you get connected mm -hmm. into a group. And speaking of being connected, if you haven't signed up for our Calvary Connection email, everyone needs to be signed up for this. Everybody. Seriously. Mm -hmm. It'll take you 10 seconds. Please go to this link and you'll see it right on our homepage. Just put in your email address and you'll be subscribed. And you'll get today's info and all the ones going forward. Um, it's a great little way to stay connected and it's so easy. Yeah, while you're at it, follow us on social as well. On Facebook, Twitter. Instagram. Just do it right now on your phone. Follow us at Calvary Monterey. Uh, on a daily basis, we're posting these kind of devotional thought videos, updates about how we're responding to the COVID-19 um, crisis that we're in right now. And we just want to take whatever we can do to lead you through this time. So if you've been feeling uh, burdened during this time, confused, hurt, uh, we want to be there for you virtually. Mm -hmm. So please follow us. Please sign up for the connection. Please tune in at calvary.com regularly. We want to see you continue to be built up in your faith and strengthened for the days ahead. So we pray you're blessed church. We love you and we'll see you soon. Bye.